Institute of Industrial History. I'm the curator, Andrea Zaya. I wanted to thank you for being here today for our annual World's Fair weekend event where we celebrate the ingenuity and the innovation of America and hearken back to the 1876 Centennial Exposition. I hope that you've been enjoying uh, your experience throughout the museum today and uh, we have a wonderful team of volunteers that if you're interested in learning more uh, or checking in of how to become a member, please check in at the front desk. Our speaker today is going to be sharing more with us on the impact of creativity and the innovation of women in the 19th century, in part due to the flexibility and the regulations surrounding the American patent system. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. John Smith, he is the Associate Professor Emeritus at Lehigh University. Dr. Smith initially went to school for engineering. His technological background has provided him a unique perspective on the history of technology and industry. After receiving his PhD from the University of Delaware in 1986, he went on to become a Newcomen Fellow in Business History at Harvard Business School from 1986 through 1987. He joined the faculty of Lehigh University in 1987 and has been recognized for his notable work on the research and development of the DuPont Corporation. He received the Newcomen Prize in Business History for the best book published in American, America and is on the editorial board of the American Chemical Heritage Society books. So please join me in welcoming Dr. John Smith. There we go. 1876, the 100th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, so they decided to hold a big fair, a big international fair. Uh, this was a tradition that had started in 1851 when Great Britain held the first great uh, international fair, the Crystal Palace. Uh, maybe the most remarkable thing about the fair in Philadelphia, in uh, London, was the building. Uh, they got way behind schedule and a uh, a greenhouse builder basically came up with the idea of making a prefab building out of uh, wrought iron uh, beams, cast iron, uh, cast iron, you know, posts, and and a couple million square feet of glass, uh, gla plate glass. It was really quite a remarkable, re remarkable building. Um, and so the United States came up. And I will say, our own Asa Packer was one of the commissioners of. Uh, uh, of you know, overseeing the fair. Um, it was quite a, quite an ambitious undertaking. Uh, all the states and the countries of the world were invited to, uh, to provide a pavilion. Uh, and it was a big success. Uh, between May and November of 1876, 10 million people uh, visited the fair. Now, the, the thing I want to do first a little bit is so, so what was the fair about, and what did uh, you know? What, what was kind of the message that people took away? So what I have here, um, I have a uh, uh, an article that was written in the New York Times, uh, and I've broken it up into three paragraphs. This is the New York Times review of the uh, World's Fair. So I'll hand out. Let's see. I've got three different. Got three different things here. I'll give you a one, and you can have a two, and I'll give you two a three, and you can have a one, and I'll give you a two, and I'll give you a three, and I'll give you, another, you guys another one. I'll just take a minute here to read the, read what the New York Times had to, the way they approached the fair.
All right. So those of you. So what's the, what's the message? What what's the message in in uh, the first paragraph? Number one. We don't want this. <laughs> Why? Why don't we? Well, we don't want what? It's, it's too much progress. It's not the. <laughs> well, people just uh, seem to be overwhelmed by the amount of change. Uh huh. Anybody else on number one? The, the critics of the fair. What what were the crit the critics of the fair? Uh, what was their criticism of the fair? The, the uh, what did they call these, these super fine people or the fastidious non observers? What were these people? What what were they? What were they? What was their critique? Why didn't they like the fair? And what would they like to have seen there? It was more a circus than an opera. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was right. Yeah, I mean, yeah. That uh, so. So instead of having all these everyday items that people would use, um, what would the critics really? What what should have been there? Let's go to the number number two. Uh, well, number two and number three. I will just lump them together. Okay, so so if people are critical of the fair, what what do they think should have been there? Yeah. The arts. Right. Right, yes. Culture. Fine arts, culture, yes. sophistication. Yes. And what did we what did we put there? Everyday items that if it was full of chock full of things that people would use every day. Okay, now and then the interest is is why is it that unlike maybe some of the more sophisticated European countries why is it that America didn't uh, didn't go for the high arts, for the fine arts, for for culture? What what was the reason given for why maybe we weren't doing that? Meaning that the people at the fair or Americans in general? Well, yeah, Amer yeah, Americans in general, yeah. Our country is much younger. Yeah, right. Right, and we've been we've been too busy, right? Mm -hmm. We've been too busy doing other things. We're young, and what was there was a uh, there was a great line in there about uh, you know um, to find fault in our crude forms of civilization and our devotion to material prosperity is like scolding a boy because he prefers the circus to the opera. Yeah, that, that maybe we don't go for the fine stuff and the high cultivated stuff because well we're just too young. We've been we've been too busy. Yeah, and these were the the two quotes that I particularly liked in that, you know, never before were gathered in one place so many sewing machines, reed organs, pianos, tables, chairs, china wares, silver plated teapots, patent plows, and a hundred thousand other things. And then again with the uh, the explanation, but with felling forests, building roads, towns and cities, subduing wilderness and exterminating savages. Uh, I know, uh, we have been excessively busy during the single century of our national existence. And of course, there's a beautiful picture, a famous American picture, westward the course of empire. You know, here we are, here's what we've been doing. Instead of painting pictures and doing sculpture and maybe writing operas, uh, this is what we've been doing. We've been We've been conquering the land, and you can see uh, the Native Americans way in the back of the, of, uh, they're looking on at, at this uh, amazing progress. Yeah. This sentence, this is the greatest country in all creation because of the wonderful array of plated teapots, patent churns, and washing machines. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, you know, the New York Times could be a little thick, they were famous for their kind of, um, I don't know, what do you say, snarky, uh, you know, they, they like to be wise guys. Elitism. Yeah, well, yeah, 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 they like to make fun of things, yes. Uh, and here, maybe this is what we should have had, right? Here's what the Italian said, uh, you know, sculpture and painting. And then, you know, I, I collect stereo views, these, three, these uh, this uh, popular photography, 3D, popular photography that was done in the late 19th and early 20th century. And I love some of the things I find. Here, on the back of one of these, it said, 
Um, the American public seem to appreciate and admire modest statues in preference to nude or scantily draped subjects. And then here's a stereo view card that I bought uh, that I have in my collection of uh, maybe, maybe not all Americans preferred um, um, dressed. Uh, uh, and then, of course, there was all kinds of really fun stuff in the state exhibits. Uh, here is, uh, I love the 1776 Liberty Bell, and this is a hoard of plenty, and I've never quite figured out exactly what this thing is made of. Uh, I, I don't think it's apples. Uh, but yeah, you think they're little pumpkins? Yeah, I, I, I haven't been able to figure out what this was. And then, of course, I love what Americans could do. Uh, you know, making, using corn, build, building buildings out of corn, and, uh, and uh, there's the apples. I, I wonder how long, uh, I wonder how long they, you know, this fair was six months. Uh, I don't know how those apples were going to fare if they sat there for six months. And then this is one of my favorite ones. Uh, this was the pavilion of the Pacific Guano Company. What, what was important about the about guano? Yeah, right. There were these islands in the South Atlantic, which had been the home of uh, seabirds forever. And the islands were just covered with guano. Um, and it made wonderful fertilizer. And so there was a big business in mining this this fertilizer and bringing it, bringing it to the United States. But as you, as you, uh, okay, now th see, we did have some culture, right? <laughs> Tiffany was already in business, and I would say this is a fairly nice example of a fine art. But as, as New York Times pointed out, the biggest building at the fair, the most popular building at the fair, was the giant machinery hall. Uh, just an immense building. And at the, at the centerpiece of that building was the great Corliss engine. Uh, it, uh, it, it produced 400 horsepower. It had two vertical cylinders that were 40 inches in diameter and had a 30 foot flywheel. And it also, they ran the machines in the exhibits. And what you can see here on the right picture is the line and shafting way that they would take power off of a steam engine. They would basically uh, take the power off to, to rotate a shaft, which is all on that wall, and then you use pulley belts, you use leather belts coming off of the rotating shaft uh, onto the machine in order to run the machine. Uh, I, wonder how much, I wonder how much noise it made uh, if they were running all those, they were running all those machines at once. Um, all right, so as part of the technology, of course, there was, you know, that Americans uh, were deeply involved in invention and new things. Uh, this is a quote I love from Ralph Waldo Emerson in 1847. <laughs> and I like what he attributes, what does he attribute innovativeness to? <laughs> Laziness, right? People are always trying to figure out a better way to do what they're doing that makes less work, right? And then, of course, there's, a, there's also a very interesting quote here. So they buy slaves where the women will permit it. Uh, I mean, we've already seen by 1847 there's a fairly large abolitionist movement, mainly led by church women. Uh, and, uh, and, and we're not, they will make the wind, the tide, the waterfall, the steam, the cloud, the lightning do the work by every art and device their cunningest mind can achieve. Um, so what I want to talk about now for a few minutes is why inventor became a particularly popular thing for Americans to do in the second half of the 19th century. And of course, the first thing I want to mention is deep in our culture uh, is the idea of personal independence. Being your own boss, being your own man. And this is one of my stereo views here of a blacksmith, uh, and, the, and the quotation being, and he, he owes not any man. You know, he's a totally independent person. Uh, you know, he is, he is uh, an independent person. And of course, how could you achieve independence? Uh, well, one way after 1862 was the Homestead Act, right? That Congress would give you um, 
you would get 160 acres of land if you could live on it for five years. Um, and here, this is a this is a postcard, and I just look at. I don't know how these people did it. <laughs> uh, I particularly like the look on the wife, the poor woman. Usually, homesteading was much harder on women than it was on men. Uh, she just looks like this is not fun. Uh, and, and one of the reasons why it was not fun is because most of the open land in America was west of the 100th Meridian, where what you can see at the roughly the 100th north-south line is that the southwest wind, instead of coming off the Gulf of Mexico, comes off of Mexico. And of course, so the rainfall drops rather dramatically. Um, it was not like farming in the east. Uh, it had to be quite different. In fact, with the low rainfall, the, the the homesteading really didn't work because 160 acres was not enough for grazing uh, and it was too much for irrigation. And of course, irrigation was very expensive. Homesteaders couldn't afford it. So homesteading, eh, you know, it, it was not, it was not something that uh, was all that easy or attractive. Another reason for an interest in inventing was uh, the uh, seeking security in an insecure age. Uh, the economy went through booms and busts uh, in the late 19th century, mainly, mainly tied to railroad financing. Uh, whenever there was a run on the banks or a panic, uh, the economy would collapse because, you know, America was raising enormous amounts of money to build railroads. Uh, and so what we see here is the unemployment rates and some of these, and it's interesting that 1876 occurred in a particularly uh, bad economic time. Um, one interesting uh, example here was Coxey's army in 1894. Um, uh, Mr. Coxey organized an army, I believe it was in Ohio, and they marched all the way to Washington, D.C., uh, asking for, uh, we're tired of a system that supplies no employment for jobless men. Uh, they wanted government infrastructure projects uh, that would put people to work. And of course, another thing at this period is a lot of people are becoming employees. Uh, and certainly, uh, uh, you know, when, when I look at these pictures of 19th century and early 20th century manufacturing, I just don't know how people did it. Uh, to sit at a desk like that all day and do some kind of repetitive task, uh, I just, I, I can't imagine doing that. You know, we, you know, we bemoan the industrial age, but man, there were a lot of really tedious, and tedious jobs in the, in the industrial period. And a lot of men, of course, are now are becoming uh, white collar clerks. So now I want to talk about some of the inventions you can see at the fair. And of course, one way uh, to get independence uh, was to ride a bicycle into the countryside. Uh, in 1876, James Starley, who was British, um, invented the ordinary bicycle, uh, which was a really uh, fascinating uh, piece of technology uh, with this very large front wheel. And uh, these things were really, f they became quite popular. They were kind of fun to ride. Now, they, they just came after the velocity craze in 1868, uh, where the wheels were basically the same size. So why in the world did Starley come up with this monster uh, as opposed to this bike, which had been around a little earlier? And let you know why. Before you have spring suspension, having a larger wheel gives you a, a gentler burden. Yeah. yeah. Now, these are, this is direct drive off of the crank. Well, how fast could you go on when the wheels are... I mean, you almost get the tricycle effect, right? Uh, your speed is really determined by the size of the front wheel. Uh, how many RPMs you could do. So the problem with the Velocipedes is you couldn't go very far fast. Uh, this thing, uh, you could go fast. And one of the interesting things is there's a, if, is there a pointer on here? There is a big button in the middle. Yep. Yeah. This, uh, this, this guy. So this is a direct drive pedal. And if you're going downhill, uh, this thing may be rotating, what, a couple hundred RPM? You don't want your foot to hit that. So here's one way they suggested to go down a hill. Uh, you put your feet up over the handlebars. Uh, and of course, um, this was the fate of many people. But still, it became a very popular invention. Okay, another um, invention that you could see at the fair was what I call the telegraph problem. 
uh, you know, the America was strung with telegraph wires. This is New York City. I just can't imagine what happened in a snowstorm uh, or a big thunderstorm with all that wire hung up. And so the, the thing was you can only send one message on a wire at one time. So there was a tremendous um, impetus for someone who could figure out how to send more than one message at a time. And of course, uh, the guy who, who figured it out uh, was young Tom Edison. Uh, this was his first big invention, uh, the quadruplex telegraph. You could send four messages at once on a telegraph, two in one direction and two in another direction. Well, there was another guy who was also trying to build a, a, a uh, build a quadruplex telegraph. And it was kind of interesting because Alexander Graham Bell uh, was a teacher of the deaf. He happened to marry um, a, a woman who was deaf, whose father was, uh, was a very rich businessman in Boston. And he wasn't sure that his daughter could be properly supported by a teacher of the deaf. So he said, Alexander, you know, this quadruplex telegraph thing, you know, whoever can come up with that, you're gonna make a ton of money selling your patent. Uh, to Western Union, the, the telegraph company. And so Bell started working on it, but what Bell came to see is that, that putting different frequencies um, electronically starts to look like language. Um, and so in 1876, uh, Bell um, uh, had this first telephone. And the interesting thing is Bell had no money, right? He wanted to sell the thing to Western Union. Uh, and Western Union said, well, uh, what's it good for? Uh, and Western Union turned him down. So Bell had to develop the thing on his own uh, with some of his father-in-law's money. But what he did is he basically did the franchise system. You know, he just sold his technology to hundreds of little small companies around the country. And of course, you couldn't tell him, you couldn't talk very far on these things. So long distance was a long distance away at that point. Another interesting uh, technology, and I love this picture, this painting, uh, the typewriter. Uh, Christopher Scholes in 1867 invents the typewriter. But the interesting thing was nobody knew what to do with it. Uh, because, and the interesting thing is at this point, a secretary was a young man. This, is the, this was the business school of the late 19th century. A young man who starts a business, he starts by doing all the letter writing for the boss. And that's how he learns the business. Uh, so there really wasn't a market for this thing. Uh, until the 1890s, uh, the Remington Company started training young women uh, in how to, how to, do the, um, how to um, operate typewriters. And of course, this was a period in women's lives, probably between when they left school and when they got married or traditionally maybe you could become a school teacher was a traditional thing for women to do. But again, uh, so these learn how to type. Well, where are they gonna work? Uh, well, one of the places was in kind of a mass, mass uh, data processing. Uh, here is uh, the uh, order room at the Sears Roebuck Company and people would send in their orders handwritten and then these women would type up the orders um, and the orders would go to different parts of the, of the facility. Um, you know, it's amazing, you know, when you Amazon, Sears was doing 20,000 orders a day uh, in the 1890s. And they had this remarkable system for getting the orders to the various departments and then collecting it all and packaging it. So, you know, so Amazon on a small scale. And then by the late, by the early 20th century, women start to become secretaries uh, business schools start to get started, like Harvard, uh, so young men would actually go to school uh, to learn business, and women became the secretaries. Another one of my favorite inventions uh, was the first plastic, celluloid. Uh, inventors were, were, were uh, in, in, in experimenting with uh, treating organic sub molecules with nitric acid, uh, and there's one really famous one. What treating a, if you take glycerin and you mix it with nitric acid, <laughs> you get dynamite, right? Well, another thing was mixing uh, uh, cellulose with nitric acid, and you got this kind of gooey plastic stuff. But it's also that's the, that's what modern gunpowder is. Uh, so the, so what you really had here was a 
the plastic was made by taking nitrocellulose and mixing it uh, with camphor. And why did it? Why did John Wesley Hyatt do this? Well, there was a perceived billiard ball shortage uh, because, again, this is one of my stereo views, uh, perhaps running out of uh, elephants. Here's a group of men with their tusks, and the caption on this stereo view is, from the jungle to America's main street. Well, it turned out that it didn't make a very good billiard ball material, and people were worried about the billiard balls exploding uh, when you broke the rack. Uh, they tried to, uh, to make false teeth out of it, and they said, you know, exploding teeth. Uh, kind of cartoonists had a good time with this thing. So one of the things he learned to do was he could make, uh, he could make celluloid look like other things, like ivory. Uh, you know, so he could make uh, articles that look like ivory. He could make articles that look like tortoise shell. Now, these may have been rather trivial uses, but ultimately celluloid came to play a really important role in technological history in that it became roll film. It became the film that made motion pictures popular. And again, it's highly flammable. In fact, all the old celluloid films now, they're held in a special bunker at uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, I believe, because they will spontaneously combust uh, under. And you just think, you're showing a movie with a, with a hot lamp and it's shining its light through gunpowder. Uh, a lot of early movie theaters burned down. Now, a lot of people, a lot of people probably walked past this thing uh, and didn't pay any attention to it at the fair. And yet, it was it was the most important piece of technology at the fair. You want to know what this is? Yes, it's an internal combustion engine, yes. Uh, you know, wh why were internal combustion engines invented? They've been around since the 1860s. A German by the name of Otto was really the first guy to build a successful one. Well, the internal combustion engines were for people who needed small amounts of power. Steam engines were big and heavy and expensive. So what if you just had a jewelry shop and you wanted a, something to buff uh, so what you could do with this is you could, internal combustion engines were made in low horsepower that could be, uh, that could be uh, used in small businesses. And of course the fuel they used was, was town gas. You know, most big cities in the world at this point had gas that was made by heating coal up to a high temperature and then, and then uh, piping it into houses where it was mainly used for lighting. But what do you think the main, if you heat coal up to a real high temperature, uh, what do you think the main component of that gas mixture is? Yes. So don't let your uh, lamp, your, your lights blow out in, uh, in your house. In fact, when a lot of people were found dead, they never knew whether it was suicide or an accident. Um, uh, so yeah, the internal combustion engine was there. And now I want to talk about the women's pavilion. Of course, uh, there was a women's pavilion. I have some examples here. Uh, so what are you going to put in the women's pavilion? Well, one of this was traditional crafts. Uh, and certainly, butter sculpture. They say Americans don't have culture. We aren't sophisticated. Butter, scul butter sculpture was a major, was a major uh, activity for women. They didn't really have refrigeration. And just think about Philadelphia in the summertime. Uh, I mean, maybe they put it on ice or something, but it, it, the buildings must have been sweltering. Uh, yeah, that is a real that is a really good question. Uh, but the interesting thing is in the women's fair that, that quite a bit of the women's fair was taken up by inventions. Uh, a Scientific American in 1870 said that inventing was not unladylike because like novel writing, it could be done in the home. Uh, so, so there were 79 women exhibitors uh, whose work filled on one quarter of the women's pavilion. 22 of these women had been showing their inventions at one fair after another. Um, the great majority of the inventions were domestic ones, washing and machines and ironing, all the things women hated to do, right? 
the worst, of course, the worst job, right, for women was washing clothes and doing ironing. You know, washing clothes, you're, you're hauling heavy water, you're dealing with caustic substances, and ironing, you're dealing with a lot of heat, even in the summertime, uh, when, you didn't want, when you didn't want all that heat. Uh, uh, dress cutting machines, sewing machines, corsets, maybe more comfortable corsets, uh, furniture and building components, um, and uh, quite a few of these were patented. Um, now, uh, I'm going to give a few examples here of the women. Uh, there were actually, uh, there were women got, somebody actually went through the patent records. In the 19th century, there were 5,200 patents given to women. Now, one of the interesting things that, that was pointed out at the beginning of the talk is, if you're a woman in the 19th century and you want to gain some capital, where can you go? And the interesting thing about the patent system is, it was one of the few institutions in America was both gender and race blind. Anybody could apply for a patent, and of course women. Martha Costin, uh, at the age of 22, was a widow with four children. Uh, and her husband had had some ideas for a pyrotechnic signal flare, a signal flare, um, and she completed the invention. Um, and then was able to sell it to the Navy um, and made, uh, made quite a bit of money off of the thing, okay? Uh, uh, another one of the women inventors was Margaret Knight, uh, who uh, we are forever indebted to her for inventing the flat bottom plastic, uh, paper bag, uh, a machine that would do that. And I think it's kind of interesting, you know, if, if you go west of the Mississippi River and you get your groceries, they always ask you if you want it in a sack. Uh, instead of wanting it in a bag. Now I thought, well, did, did uh, Margaret Knight's invention never make it west of the Mississippi? That in the east we put stuff in bags, and in the west they put it in sacks. Okay, and another, another woman inventor was uh, Helen Augusta Blanchard, who invented the, uh, the sewing machine, the, uh, the zigzag, the zigzag sewing machines. Um, and the interesting thing is, you know, some of these women inventors were from, you know, well-established middle-class families and they were inventing uh, because it may have been a hobby or something. But really, a lot of the women inventors, they were doing this as a profession. They actually, they actually needed the money and uh, this was one place where they could get it. Now, uh, so, and of course, African-Americans, right? African-Americans' opportunities for for uh, getting capital in the 19th century were really limited. And it isn't surprising that, that uh, African Americans, some of them were attracted to inventing. We don't, we don't really have a very good quantitative estimate of how many patents were actually given to African Americans because how can you go through a list of names? You know, all you have on the patent is names. So you really can't go through a list of names and figure out uh, you know, who was an African-American inventor. And a few of the notable ones here, Elijah McCoy invented an, auto, an automatic lubricating cup for railroads, for locomotives. Uh, before that, the lubrication had to be done by hand with, a, you know, with a little oil can and squirting oil everywhere. He put in a little drip lubrication. Now, there's a big debate here. Uh, was this the origin of the phrase, the real McCoy? Uh, there, there, like I said, there's a debate. There isn't really any evidence, but uh, you know what? Some people will claim that this is this is the origin of that his lubricating cup was the real McCoy. If you bought other ones, they were some cheap knockoff uh, made by some other guy. But if he had an, a patent, he would have had you know 17 years of exclusive use. Um, another uh, African American inventor was Louis Latimer. Uh, who worked on light bulbs, he came up with a better filament. Uh, you know, uh, Edison used a carbonized cotton thread. I believe that uh, Latimer came up with a, with a bamboo uh, filament which would last longer and give uh, a brighter light. Um, and and another, another African American, Granville Woods, uh, who was known as the uh, of course, the, Af the African-American Edison, he ended up with 50 patents 
in his lifetime. He ended up specializing in uh, electrical, a lot of electrical stuff. Uh, his main uh, contribution was uh, developing a telegraph system which would work from a moving train uh, to a stationary station. Okay, uh, now just to wrap up here, uh, you can see here the uh, enthusiasm for inventing uh, with the number of patents that are awarded in the United States beginning about 1853. Uh, you know, to, so there's a lot more patents being given. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of fun with these. So one of my favorite ones is, uh, two of my favorite ones are clothespins. There were like 50 or 60 different patents on clothespins. I keep thinking, how in the world can you come up with like 50 or 60 different designs for clothespins? And of course, another one of my great favorites was barbed wire. You know, the, you know, why, why was barbed wire so important? Why was barbed wire such an important invention? Yeah. My guess would be it would keep animals in their place. Yes. But where, where was it really important? All those settlers that were homesteading the West. In the West, yeah. And what was the big fight in the West? In many of the Western movies. It was the, right, it was the ranchers whose cattle ran roughshod over the prairie and the poor homesteaders who were going to try to fence off some land and actually grow crops. Uh, but there wasn't any wood, right, out there. And uh, so barbed wire became a uh, very important technology about 1873. Uh, and one of the things, barbed wire collecting out in Kansas is a really big thing. And people have like in their dens like plaques with like, there's like a thousand different types of barbed wire. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting, it's an interesting hobby, uh, collecting barbed wire. Okay, the other, the final thing I want to point here to is, uh, uh, oops, what did I do here? Okay, um, is, is uh, the interesting thing about the, the trend here, and then one of the interesting trends here is, okay, one, people who get one patent, maybe amateurs, declines, you know, substantially. People who get two patents, maybe again amateurs, three patents. But what's interesting here is the number of people who get 10 patents or more. Because what we clearly see here is that there is a group of people in America at this point who are, who, really trying to earn a living uh, patented. Of course, the other thing is, we also have the rise of corporations here, so some of these patents are being taken out by corporations. But still, patenting, trying to, and most of the people, their idea was patent something, I'll patent something, I'll get a patent, and I'll sell it. Uh, I will sell it to uh, the company. And one, one final anecdote here, the railroads. The railroads didn't patent a lot of their innovations. But inventors would find out the technology that the railroads were using. They would patent it and then hold the railroad up for enormous damages. Uh, sometimes they would ask for 10, 10 times. I mean, uh, th this became a real problem for the railroads, uh, that they were getting held up by these, uh, by these uh, inventors all the time. All right, so I guess we have we have some time here. Um, if anybody has any questions, yeah. How often did that actually work for people? It, it, so you say that railroads would come up with an idea, and then someone else would jump in and patent it, and then try to sue the railroad for it. And was that a problem for the railroads because they were losing those battles, or just because they were having to spend a lot of money defending themselves? They were losing. Sure. Yeah. But then you know, later on, the patent system begins to to come up. Of course, big corporate money and lawyers, you know, this kind of prior prior use uh, exemption, that if you had an invention and you could prove that you were using it before it got patented, you could continue to use it. You know, you know. So that has the they weren't, they weren't going to let these pirates, they weren't going to let these pirates get away with this forever. So, so, you know, the courts ultimately changed their, you know, it, it yeah, like I said, the, the prior use doctrine. When did that prior use doctrine come into being? That's a good question, but it was done for probably in the 1890s, I would guess, because that's when the railroads are really getting held up uh, for, you know, for people taking patents on things and then suing the railroads and getting big settlements from them. 
Yeah. yeah. What was the process for just a ravaged Joe to go out and get a patent? Would they go to a local attorney to work with? Or? There were patent attorneys. Locally. Yeah, and yeah. And if you, Scientific American, right? The, the journal Scientific American, which goes all the way back to, gosh, it goes way back in the 19th century. It was, it was a journal for, for, for inventors. And, uh, and, and in the advertising in Scientific American, you could always find people advertising uh, to help you get your patent. Anything else? I'm assuming that that's uh, country and western song here from time to time, don't fence me in, was actually a political song that went on. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. On that track of passions behind you, do you have any theory for cause of why, like 1972, why all of a sudden it's like they really dropped in that thing? How different from the right side of the ground? Well, well uh, that was, uh, there was an enormous. Uh, economic collapse in 1873. The yeah, but 19, the 19, no. I gotta go to the right side. 1972. Where? Where is it? No, the on the ground. Look at your ground. Yeah, on the ground. Oh, okay. Went up to the right hand side. Oh, of the oh I see. I see it now. Oh. Uh, that, well, they they have made patenting more expensive. Uh, it's not as easy or cheap to get a patent as it used to be. I, I, I don't know if that, I, I actually don't know the reason why, but it is, it's not as easy for an individual to get a patent as it, as it was. They have made it pretty expensive. Uh, but, but they're trying to discourage people from, you know, trying to patent, you know, trivial things. Now, if you really want to get a patent today, I think you're going to spend five or $10,000. Yeah, and it's interesting because um, there aren't a whole lot of patents that dominate any of those any of those technologies. You know, I mean, you know, I don't know if anybody knows the story of Xerox Park. That Xerox set up a a, a research laboratory in the early 1970s in Palo Alto, and they put this guy Bob Taylor in it. Now Bob Taylor is the most interesting, unknown person in American history. He was working at the Pentagon in 1968, and he's the one who came up with the idea that wouldn't it be great if computers could talk to each other, and he put out the first request for proposals to create the internet. So Bob Taylor was the father of the internet he goes to work for Xerox. They send him out to Palo Alto and say, hire 50 really smart people and come up with the office of the future. Well, they invented everything. They invented the PC. They invented Ethernet. They invented printing. Uh, but Xerox, the corporate people, were too busy defending their copier business from the Japanese. Now, if they'd have been smart, they'd have said, forget the copy business. Forget the copiers. Let the Japanese make copiers. This is going to be the big thing. But what happened is all the technology walked out the door. In fact, the idea for Windows, a woman at Xerox Park invented the idea of Windows. Steve Jobs asked if he could come up to Xerox Park and see what was going on. He saw her approach and took it away and, you know, and made Windows. And then, of course, the irony is, then he sues Bill Gates for stealing Windows, or stealing his, you know, Windows idea when Jobs stole it from Xerox Park. Uh, you know, it is interesting that, you know, that, you know, and there never was a fundamental patent on the computer. Um, there, there never was, and so, uh, you know, the, well, it's interesting the way things, the way things evolve. But patents, patents really haven't been, I don't know the question of patenting software, right? Was a, Another issue. Okay, any anything you know, else? Another example of what you were just saying something we just read about the oil industry. Yeah. Exxon. And they early on did all this research on alternative energy. Yeah. 
and they were the leaders yeah. in the wind and solar, and, and if they had decided to go that way instead of turning their back on it, they'd probably be the leaders now in wind and solar and all that kind of stuff. It's hard to lose money pumping oil out of the ground. Yeah. And if you look what the oil companies have done, they've gotten out of refining. There's no money in refining. And they've gotten out of, most of them have gotten out of retailing. So now really they're just companies that own oil in the ground. Um, and uh, you know, it's, it's hard to lose money on, on oil in the ground. So why work so hard? Why work so hard when you can make money so easy? <laughs> But it is interesting that they did do, that they did do all that work. And I guess if you go back to the 1970s, I guess we really did think that maybe we were running out of oil, you know, and that we were going to have to find new sources of energy rather quickly. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. How much uh, do you think the uh, London exhibition? But I guess happened what about 20 years earlier than uh, than the Philadelphia one. Did that influence the design of how Phil, how Philadelphia put, how this was put together by the com commission? That yeah, yeah. In fact, um, there was a there was a Crystal Palace uh, exhibit in uh, in New York in 1853 where they tried to copy what the British done. Because you know these are all temporary buildings, you know, right? I mean, they these buildings were not meant. They were all torn down um, after the fair, so we didn't really want to build something that was very substantial. Mm -hmm. So just using iron, iron, you know, iron girders and, and you know, and, and glass was a way to quickly throw up a building, and then it was relatively easy to take them apart. Mm -hmm. The Crystal Palace in London, though, it it, it stayed until it, it ultimately burned up, which must have been a spectacular fire, but. It stayed around for decades, mm -hmm. um, and they kept using it. They, you know, they kept having these fairs: London in 1862, Paris in 1867. Uh, and this gave me kind of part of an international competition of like, you know, who's got the best technology? Uh, you know, who's got all the all the all the really good new things? So it was a, you know, there was well, there was Chicago in 1893. Um, and then St. Louis in 1904. There were a lot of these fairs. When did they start calling the World's Fairs? That's a good question. <laughs> that's, I, I, I would have to go back. I, that's a good, I, I actually don't know the answer and to Chicago, that. Chicago, 1893, isn't that when the first one was invented? Yes, it was, it was, yeah. And of course, where did the hub for it come from? <laughs> Yay! And it was really a giant bicycle wheel. Really, it was literally a giant bicycle wheel. And uh, why would people want to, it was 220 feet in diameter, why would anybody want to ride on a Ferris wheel back then? Yeah, right. Most people never been 200 feet above the ground. So the Ferris wheel, it held like 2,000 people at a time. And, and it had like railroad cars. And you would go around once or twice because they would unload every other car. So you would slowly, slowly go up. But when they continuously moving. Well, they couldn't because you had to load people in and out. I think they they just ran every other car. And I thought, uh, I know, like in Europe, I've never been there, but I've seen pictures. The wheels, the wheels rotate slowly, and it's slow, slow enough that people can step in and out. Yeah, but if you got thirty people in a car, you're not going to be able to. That's not going to work with thirty people. And actually, I've actually seen the thing called, on another stereo view, I've heard it, I've seen it called an observation wheel. So really the idea was you were gonna get way up in the sky and you were gonna get to see a view of, your, of the city um, that you know, you'd never seen before because you know what, people didn't get that high in, in the late 19th century. Yeah, the Ferris wheel became a very, after that it became, every fair had to have a Ferris wheel. And the stereo views are still, they're worth 15, 15 or $20, the ones with Ferris wheels.